I've had about three soft free software businesses during all this time. I stopped that one in October 1985 because we started the Free Software Foundation and it seemed appropriate for the Free Software Foundation to be the, the seller of these tapes in Emacs. And the Free Software Foundation brought in uh, over several years probably a couple of million dollars selling tapes and then ma free manuals as well. So I probably could have been comfortably well off if I had just kept on doing it myself. But I, I felt that as the president of the FSF, I shouldn't be undercutting it and competing with it. So I stopped doing this. And instead, I made a living by selling support on the free programs I had developed. People would hire me to make changes in them. And I would charge a lot of money. It got up to uh, $250 an hour. Uh, but they would hire me because they figured since I wrote the program in the first place, I could probably do a good job and, and work in less time than someone else. And also I would teach classes in things relating to these programs. And that continued until I didn't need to do it anymore because I got a big prize. So if not for that, I would just have continued it. And after that, other people started businesses doing this and uh, there was a free software company with, I think, a hundred people and a hundred people in its payroll, uh, whose business was in entirely supporting free software, mostly software I had written. But they, they wrote some of it too. Because in the course of doing this support, what you're doing is you're adding to the software. <clears throat> and nowadays, I get paid for some of my speeches. Like, I'm getting paid for this one, but not the one earlier this afternoon. And that's enough. <clears throat> so, there are actually many different kinds of free software businesses that have been set up by people over the years. And I recently heard that in France, there are now 1,400 people in this field. Working, that is, working for companies whose business is free software and its support. Now, I presume they're not all programmers because no software company is made up entirely of programmers. Programmers are typically only 10% of a software company, but when they're free software companies, usually the percentage of programmers is greater than that. <coughs> so, by the early 90s, we had almost all the necessary pieces, but one major component was still missing, the kernel. We started developing our kernel in 1990 using a design I thought that I chose because I thought it would get the job done quicker. We started with Mach as the basis, Mach being released as free software just at that time. And then we only had to write the user programs that would do the, the work of a Unix kernel on top of Mach. And I thought that since there was a lot of a job we wouldn't have to do, and since these were user programs, that we could get them to work much more quickly. I don't know why, but instead it took ages to get them to run at all. Perhaps it was too much of a research project. Uh, perhaps the people told me that the debugging environment was not reliable. Various things went wrong. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait for that because in 1991, a Finnish college student named Linus Torvalds wrote a kernel, which he released under the name Linux. And then in 1992, he put it under a free software license. And he got this kernel to barely work in less than a year, enough that it was a good a starting point from which to advance. So by 1992, when he made it free software, people were able to use this kernel to fill the remaining gap in the GNU system, producing a complete free operating system that was basically GNU with Linux added. The development of Linux the kernel was a major contribution to our community. That was the step that carried us across the finish line. Before that point, there were many pieces of GNU 
and some of them were superior to the things that were available as part of Unix. So a lot of people would, ins you know, would install them and run them, but all they had to have some other system to run them on. After Linux filled the last gap, there was a complete system. You could get a bare PC and install this free operating system and use a computer in freedom. So the goal we had set out to reach in 1984 had been reached. But at the same time, a confusion developed. People started thinking that the entire operating system was Linux. And this confusion was a serious blow to the free software movement. Because before that time, the people who installed various pieces of GNU knew that they were doing so, and they became GNU fans. And so, when they came across the articles we had written about the philosophy of GNU, which is the same philosophy I'm telling you now, well, they weren't guaranteed to agree with us, but at least they would pay serious attention since they were fans of GNU and this was the philosophy of GNU. After there was the complete GNU system with Linux that you could get and run, and people started thinking of it as, well, oh, sorry, I, I'm, I see I'm actually a bit sleepy today in a subtle way. I've noticed it during this speech. I have to apologize. So, before that point, our software spread, uh, spread the philosophy. And the philosophy helped extend our software because it, people, when they read this, if they agreed, they'd be motivated to develop more free software to add to GNU. However, after people started using essentially the GNU system with, with Linux added and calling it all Linux, it no longer led them to the philosophy associated with GNU, the philosophy of free software. Instead, it led people to the philosophy associated with the name Linux, the apolitical philosophy of Linus Torvalds, who thinks that all software licenses are legitimate and it's wrong ever to violate one. So his views on this are more or less the same as Microsoft's. <clears throat> now, he of course has the right to promote his views. What I object to is when our work becomes the main basis of promoting his views because it's attributed to him indirectly by labeling the GNU system as Linux. And that's why I ask people to call the system GNU slash Linux, or GNU plus Linux if you prefer. Give us equal mention. We need it. We need it not just because it's fair, but because it will help people recognize what we've done so that they will think about what we are asking them to help us do. Our work is not finished. People will sometimes give me advice which in other circumstances might have been wise. They will say, it looks bad to ask for credit. And that's true, people will be prejudiced against you if you do, unless you have enough money. <laughs> <clears throat> and so they'll say, when people call the system Linux, smile to yourself and take pride in a job well done. This would be very wise advice if it were true that the job is done. We've made a great beginning. We have developed more than one free operating system in our community and many free application programs. But there are many other application programs we still have to develop. We have developed free operating systems used by tens of millions of users. But there are hundreds of millions of users of proprietary operating systems. And even the people using free operating systems often use proprietary programs on top of that. So we have a tremendous amount of work left to do. <clears throat> and we also have something that we never had before. We have enemies, rich and powerful enemies. <clears throat> such as Microsoft and the governments whose support it manages to win, like the government of the US and the government of Australia. <clears throat> uh, 
Microsoft has stated in some of its internal documents that it intends to try to stop us from developing the free software that users want. So we now face a lot of obstacles and it's not just a matter of software development. We've proved that we're good at software development. You know, we have a lot more software to develop, but it's, I'd say, probably not more than 10 times what we've already done. And the rate at which we're growing, clearly we'll be able to do that mm -hmm. if we're not forbidden from helping, from serving the public. <clears throat> when we started, I couldn't have been sure of that. I didn't know we'd ever have a, a free operating system. I was just determined to do my best. But today, empirically, we know that the free software community can develop a wide range of software and make it very good for a wide range of users, not just for wizards and geeks, but for ordinary users as well. Today, free software is just as good. Today, the main question is whether we will be allowed to develop the software that users want. In the US, there are already two laws forbidding the development of various kinds of free software. <clears throat> One of these laws is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the law that forbids free software to access encrypted or somehow blocked off data. This law was used to prohibit the free software for playing a DVD. If you buy a DVD in the US, it's lawful for you to watch the movie. But the free software that would enable you to do this on your free GNU slash Linux system has been censored completely. There is, in fact, no lawfully available software in the US that you could use to watch a DVD. And I'm afraid it's going to be the same in Australia. But they've carried this even further. People, there, there is a, there's certain, there's a certain computer game that's accompanied by a network server that allows people to play against each other. And they communicate with some kind of encrypted protocol. And people figured this out and implemented their own server. And they have their own free game, which is somewhat similar. They wrote it themselves. It's not a modified ver They didn't modify it from the proprietary game. That would have been illegal anyway. So they wrote their own game, and they have their own server. And you can use either game to talk to either server. <clears throat> and they were sued, and this is a court ruled that, that these free alternatives are illegal under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Now, please note that using either one of these free alternatives doesn't enable anyone to use the proprietary one without paying. If they want to use the free game to talk to the server, they're going to have to get an account on the server, just like as if they were using the proprietary game. And if they're using the free server with the proprietary game, well, they're not using the, propri the, 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 pr the authorized server, so why should they be expected to pay for it? What we have here is just two separate products being tied together through the use of this law. If Australia establishes a similar law, there's a danger that the same thing will happen here. This law is used to impose DRM, digital restrictions management, on the public. So they're not satisfied with prohibiting people from sharing with their neighbors. They want to redesign your computer system to stop you from sharing. And this is wrong. DRM is fundamentally wrong in itself because it stops people from cooperating with their neighbors. And a government of the people, by the people, for the people will not enact laws that support DRM in any way. <clears throat> so that's one law which, threat, which prohibits certain kinds of free software. Another law in the U.S. Which, prohib which can prohibit free software for any purpose of any kind is patent law. That's what I gave my speech about 
earlier this afternoon, and I won't repeat it now, but in the U.S., any kind of software idea for use in any kind of software can be patented by someone, which means when you implement that idea, you can get sued. Now, large programs combine many ideas. <clears throat> A program can combine easily hundreds or thousands of different ideas. And if any one of those ideas is patented, your chances of developing a large program without infringing many patents is absurdly small. So software patents are obstacles to all software development and they threaten users as well. The users can also be sued for the software they're using, for the way they've configured their machines, basically for whatever their computers are doing, they can be sued. <clears throat> and this is advertised as a scheme to promote progress, but economic research shows it can just as well do the opposite. <clears throat> now, I used to have to ask people to imagine how many different patents one program could be prohibited by at once. I would say dozens, maybe 50. Well, now we don't have to imagine. Somebody did a study. It must have been a lot of work. He picked one particular program, namely Linux, the kernel of the GNU slash Linux system. And he checked for all the US patents that cover something that can be found somewhere in Linux. He found 286 different US patents that cover parts of Linux. And Linux is just one part of the system. I saw an estimate that it, somewhere else that it was 0.25% of the system. So if we multiply, we can get a rough estimate of around 100,000 or so different software idea patents in the US that would cover ideas used somewhere in the GNU slash Linux system of today. Of course, that's a rough estimate, and it wouldn't surprise me if it were only 30,000 or as much as 300,000. So now you see the danger. And since this danger is not only for free software developers, but for all software developers, aside perhaps from the mega corporations, there is actually a very broad movement against software idea patents. This movement which I'm glad to say I played a major role in starting about 14 years ago, has actually persuaded the European Parliament, which voted a year ago to reject software idea patents. Now, the European Union is set up to have only a little democracy in it. The European Parliament doesn't have the power you'd expect a country's parliament to have. It just, play, it just is one step in the thing. And the process is not over yet, and we're still fighting it. But there's a good chance that we can win at the level of the European Union. Organizing to fight and win this battle in Australia is going to be up to you. <clears throat> of course, Microsoft really wants software idea patents. Microsoft has stated that it intends to use software idea patents to kill off the GNU slash Linux system. <clears throat> For instance, you may have heard how Microsoft was a defendant in a software patent lawsuit. Uh, the patent belonged to a company called EOLUS, which also, and the same patent threatened anyone who wanted to implement things on the World Wide Web. It was a, a technique of using plugins that's essential to the World Wide Web. The victim, the the. The parasite just picked Microsoft as the first victim. So when I saw this, I didn't say, hooray, Microsoft has been hurt. I said, if they can do that to Microsoft, they can do it to you and me. Fortunately, that patent then got overturned subsequently. <clears throat> and now I heard that Microsoft got a patent on something similar. <laughs> Another thing that's that we're working to implement now is a free Java platform. One of the big dangers in our community is that people start putting non-free software into the system 
and they call it a bonus. They say it's, it's a nice addition, it gives you more features. Well, yes, it gives you more features at the cost of your freedom. When these things are distributed separately, they call them value-added packages. And that term makes a statement about their values. It says, value your convenience only, don't value your freedom. So I prefer to call them freedom subtracted <coughs> packages. That makes a statement about my values. But they also include them, incorporate them in various distributions of the GNU slash Linux system. <clears throat> For instance, Sun has a version of the GNU slash Linux system which they call the Java desktop. Now, they're not giving credit either to Linux or GNU, but that's not the important issue when, when you look at what they're doing that's really bad, which is including several non-free programs, including Sun's Java platform. Sun's Java platform is not free software. You shouldn't install it. And if you do install it, you're putting yourself at risk of creating other problems for other people. There are people who are so attracted to Java, they think this, this idea that it will run on all platforms is so exciting that they stop paying attention to things they ought to pay attention to. They will write programs in Java, they'll write free software in Java, and then offer it to people, and it turns out it doesn't run on all platforms. It doesn't run on a free platform. You see, we have free Java platforms, but they don't implement all the features yet. Sun keeps on adding features, and we're, you know, our efforts are speeding up, but they're still behind. So some, many of the standard Java libraries or the newer language features, we don't have yet. So if you use them in your free program, then it will run on a free platform and you'll find that your program is actually an inducement to people to install non-free software. The same thing happens when websites use Java or when websites use Flash. The use of Flash <coughs> in websites is a major problem for our community. People are working on free software for playing Flash and now it more or less handles just the display of things but it doesn't handle reading input. If you see a website using Flash, complain. Complain to the site developer saying, you're excluding people who believe in maintaining their freedom. Please get rid of the Flash from your site. A similar kind of problem occurs when people distribute files in Word format. And People's approach to this used to be find some way, scrounge up some way to arrange to read it. And I pointed out that this is actually not the right response in the long run. You see, you see people are figuring, people have worked on figuring out the details of secret word format. And I figured out a lot of them. So there is free software today like OpenOffice that can read most word files. But it's it's still, it's short-term thinking to, to address the problem this way because Microsoft can keep changing word format. And every time they introduce a new version of word format, some people get that and they make word files in this new format and they send them to other people and other people can't read them and so they feel they have to upgrade word as well and the result is a large number of these Windows users are using the new version of Word and they send us these modified, this, these Word files that are in a different format which our software can't read. And maybe it's patented and we'll get sued if we make our free software read it. So what do we do? To really solve this problem we have to remove Microsoft's control over the language that people use to communicate with each other and with themselves. I say communicate with themselves, I mean saving a file so that, you could, so that you can read your own file later. We have to refuse to use word format for this. When people send you a word file, therefore, don't cope with the situation by reading it. Instead, it's much better to send back a message saying, please don't ever send me word files. This is contributing to a serious social problem. 
please send, when you send files to other people, and it's not just me, send it in public documented formats that everyone is free to implement so that you are not giving a particular company any kind of power it shouldn't have. Fundamentally, the use of a non-free program gives somebody power of a kind that nobody should have. And therefore, software should be free. Computer users should always have the freedom to control their own computers. And they should be free to cooperate with each other in doing so. <clears throat> we, have all be we are all familiar with the concept of human rights. And over the centuries, people have developed certain ideas of what human rights are. It's true that human rights are on the retreat all around the world today as various governments pass laws taking them away. You may have heard of the USA Pat Riot Act. Uh, its supporters like to call it the Patriot Act, but really every one of those letters is an initial. It's one long acronym, so where you divide it up is arbitrary. And therefore, it's just as correct to call it the USA Pat Riot Act. Well, in Australia, there are a number of tyrannical laws that were adopted supposedly to protect you from terrorism, but they are a much worse danger than any terrorist could ever be. <clears throat> the Australian government can arbitrarily ban any organization without a trial, and then anyone who's been associated with it can be tr tried just for associating with it. So they can take something you're doing and turn it into a crime. And the organization doesn't even get a chance to clear its name. No trial. And in, in the UK, I've seen similar sorts of laws. <clears throat> you know, situations where, for practical purposes, the crime consists of being accused, and the only way to get off is to prove something. <clears throat> and so there goes the idea of innocent until proven guilty. <clears throat> On a previous visit to Canberra, I saw a copy of the Magna Carta enshrined, so to speak. And I'm sure it's still enshrined there today, even though what it says is now a dead letter. Freedom of association, the rights of the accused are being taken away in Australia. <clears throat> but as we, as, as we develop new activities in life, we discover additional human rights that pertain to these new activities. The use of computers is just a few decades old. The use of computers by more than a few specialists is really only 15 years old. And as a result, People have not yet come to recognize what the essential human rights are for computer users. <coughs> so I suggest that the free software movement has identified what some of these human rights are. Some of the rights that every computer user should always have. And I hope that somehow together we will be able to prevail in defending these freedoms. History shows us that freedom doesn't defend itself automatically. The only way we can keep our freedom is to make efforts, is to insist in keep on keeping our freedom, and to refuse to give it up for some short-term <coughs> possible benefit, like keeping us safe from terrorists, or getting some job done on our computers today. <coughs> and therefore, in order for people to keep their freedom, they have to fight for their freedom. And in order to fight for their freedom, they have to value their freedom. And in order to value their freedom, they have to recognize what it is. Which means that a fundamental job we have in the free software community is to teach people about these issues of freedom. In the 90s, the GNU slash Linux system became popular. It became cool. And a lot of people started using it purely for its practical benefits. 
And these people would tell what a nice system it was. They'd say, it's so powerful, it's reliable, it'll run for months without crashing, and it's cheap, and it's cool. So use it. And they wouldn't mention that it respects your freedom. It allows you to keep your freedom instead of surrendering it. So the result was millions of users who had never even heard of these issues of freedom. And then in 1998, some of them started another, another way of talking about free software, where they call it open source. And with this different name, they've associated a different set of ideas. They don't say that this is a matter of the freedoms that every user should have. In fact, they will often say that when asked that they disagree with that idea. Instead, that they say they say that they have that they recommend a development methodology, which they say will generally produce more powerful and reliable software. And that may be true. I hope it's true. It would be nice if freedom provides as a as a byproduct superior software. But it's a terrible mistake, I think, to focus all the attention on these short-term practical benefits and ignore freedom itself. The danger is that then people will fail to defend their freedom when it's threatened because they won't recognize what it is. So you'll, if you imagine a person who, two people, one who has been convinced by the open source philosophy and another who's been convinced by the free software philosophy. And you show these people a powerful, reliable, convenient, non-free program. What are they going to say? The open source person will say, I'm surprised you were able to do such a good job without letting the users study the code and find the bugs for you, but I can't argue with the facts. It seems to be a powerful, reliable program. And he'll probably use it. Whereas the free software will per person will say, I don't care how powerful and convenient it is if it takes away my freedom. I won't pay such a high price for that convenience. I'm going to get to work on the free replacement for this program right away before anybody else gets tempted to use that program. <laughs> One person will give up his freedom whenever you can offer him convenience in, re in return and the other will fight for his freedom. And if enough of you fight for your freedom, freedom may prevail. So, before I end by introducing my alter ego, I'd like to say that I've got some copies of my book of essays for sale outside for $20. And I've also got some nice FSF key rings and FSF pins for sale as well. And I've also got some stickers to give away. These are GNU and Linux stickers. They have a flying GNU and a flying penguin, <laughs> both equally unrealistic. <laughs> and with the stickers, take as many as you can make good use of. So now, People sometimes have accused me of having a holier-than-thou attitude. I think that's not actually true. I don't criticize and condemn people just because they don't stand up for free software as strongly as I do. As long as what they're doing is good, I'll say that what they're doing is good. And I might suggest additional things that they could do. However, I do have a holy attitude because I'm a saint. It's my job to be holy.
I am Saint Ignatius <laughs> of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. Emacs started out as a text editor, which then became a way of life for many users, since you can do almost everything without exiting Emacs, and ultimately a religion. <laughs> If anyone knows what the alt.religion.emacs news group was used for, please tell me. I, I never read net news, so I never actually knew. We even have a great schism between two rival versions of Emacs, and now we have saints too. Fortunately, no gods. In this church, instead of gods, we have an editor. <laughs> To be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the Confession of the Faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> the Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with some other churches. To be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> <clears throat> However, it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exercise the evil proprietary operating systems that possess whatever of the computers under your control, and then install in all of them a wholly free operating system <laughs> instead, where holy, of course, can be spelled in multiple ways. <laughs> and then only install free software on top of that. If you make this commitment and live by it, then you too will be a saint, and you may eventually have a halo if you can find one, because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me if it's a sin in the Church of Emacs to use the editor VI. <laughs> it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free version of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> and sometimes people ask me if my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> so thank you. And now I'm ready for questions. How do you think the, um, the push by? major software companies to encourage hardware vendors to incorporate um, digital rights management hardware into their devices. How are going to digital affect? restrictions management. <laughs> okay, what you're talking about is treacherous computing. Its advocates call it trusted computing, of course. But what they mean is that software developers can trust your computer to obey them and disobey you. So looked at from their point of view, it's trusted. From your point of view, it's treacherous. And this is extremely dangerous, and it ought to be illegal. In fact, I would recommend that countries pass laws requiring any new computers sold with such equipment uh, provide, you know, for instance, if it's sold with some kind of uh, encryption or signature device, that the law should require that all keys included in this machine be accessible to the user to read and to set. And that would turn it into a quite useful, potentially useful at least, digital signature and, and encryption facility under the user's control rather than a device for others to control the user. I have the feeling that if you take your talk and you change uh, the word software, each time you use it by music, it will still work. No. And the reason is software, and in fact it wouldn't work. Because you see, software is an example of, of a work that serves a functional purpose. What was the question? Uh, I'll, you, don't worry. <laughs> it will be clear enough, quickly enough. 
Whereas music is a work of art or entertainment. It doesn't serve a functional purpose. And you're, if, if you don't like a piece of music, you're not screwed in the same way as you are if a program does bad things or doesn't do what you want, because you're using the program. Music is not meant to be used, and it isn't used in this practical sense. So you're not in a situation where you try to do the job you want to do, and that damn piece of music just doesn't make it possible. <laughs> because music is an artistic or entertaining work, not a functional work. So my, conclu my broader conclusion is that works that serve a functional purpose must be free. People must be free to publish modified versions of them as well as to redistribute unmodified copies and to change their own copies and to use them freely. The same four freedoms that apply to free software apply to all kinds of functional works, including, for instance, recipes and manuals and textbooks and reference works such as dictionaries and encyclopedias. And we're making a lot of progress on this. Recipes, of course, are treated as free, and people, cooks generally enjoy these freedoms and use them all the time. Uh, the free encyclopedia, Wikipedia, is now the big, by far the biggest encyclopedia in history, and people have been telling me it's of good quality as well. So this sh should soon be the world's dominant encyclopedia, and it's free in the same sense. We need to develop free dictionaries. We need to develop free curricula, and there are already projects to develop free curricula. All the teaching materials that a school needs, they ought to be free. And this could be done just by thousands of teachers, each doing a small piece. We just have to work together, and in 10 years, for certain, it'll be done. Um, <clears throat> could I uh, not so much ask a question, but suggest another way of looking at that answer about music? I think you're actually wrong. Um, <laughs> because um, as, as a musician, one of the uh, frequent problems that we have is obtaining copies of the scores um, for, for various forms of classical music, choral, orchestral. The um, rights management associated with that is fairly nasty if you want to get multiple copies for an ensemble to perform. Mm -hmm. There has been a movement in there there's, there's, um, to make things available on the net. For instance, I recommend the uh, Coral Public Domain Library. Um, and also, um, with some of the changes in copyright, uh, the co companies are managing to keep control of a lot of music that, until changes in the copyright laws, would have been available 50 years after the death of the creators, but are now being grabbed on because... Yes, they're noticed. extending copyright, which is an injustice. Mm. But there's, there's they're a lot taking of away your freedom. Around. Yep. <laughs> you have to realize that you know, your government and mine are the enemy of the public on these issues. They work for the, for the corporations that pay them. They don't work for us. Yeah. It tends to work against the actual um, classical composers as well. We can't get oh, yes. work formed because they're owned by a publishing company which will not give amateur ensembles the rights to perform these, so they just die. Yeah, well, for th these... These companies frequently like to pretend that when they ask for additional power to restrict the public, that they're doing so in the name of the authors and musicians. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when you inquire a bit, you find that they're grinding most of those authors and musicians into the ground with their heels. With a few exceptions, those who are superstars. The superstars have a lot of clout, so they eventually manage to get good treatment from the publishers. But, and those are the ones, of course, most prominent. So whenever there's some kind of legislative hearing, they'll trot out a few t superstars to talk about how it, unjust it would be if their copyrights were to expire only 50 years after they die or whatever. <laughs> you know, an injustice if, if their great-grandchildren don't get to be supported in, as well as their grandchildren. Uh, but, of course, the, the, the majority of authors and musicians are, are getting nothing from the record companies, and would, for instance, and, and would be better off if we could eliminate the record companies. But that's another speech. <laughs> However, I won't say that, that, we need, that we must have the freedom to change 
these works of art and entertainment today. You know, if you're using a, something for practical use in your life today, you've got to have the freedom to change it today. But now, for, for when it comes to changing works of music... Arrangement is... Yeah. You know, that's a useful contribution to music. But it's not desperately essential that you must be able to do it today. If you had to wait ten years, it would be no... It, music would still go on. But I, I can't give that speech today, unfortunately. What's your advice to uh, aspiring programmers that may be faced with the only choice of employment uh, working for a, soft, a software company making the for software? Well, that can't be true because, you know, remember, most people don't know how to program at all and they have some choices <laughs> of employment. And those choices, are a lot of them are probably open to you as well. But please keep in mind that most software development is neither free software nor proprietary software. Most software development is developing in-house software or custom software meant to be used by one client alone. And as long as that client has the four freedoms, then you're not doing anything wrong. So, you know, chances are if you could get employment as a programmer, it will be that kind anyway. And if you were, if you've refused to develop proprietary software, well, that's a small fraction of the programming field. Still, the majority of it is still open to you. In addition, of course, there are more and more people getting, who are making a living through free software development. Free, you see, when a program is proprietary, a user has two choices, take it or leave it. When it's free, the user has more choices. The user can use it as is. The user cannot use it. The user can make this change. The user can make that change. The user can make that change, or that change, or that change. So many different possibilities. Of course, most of these users, they're businesses, or they might be government agencies. And if they want to make a change, that means they're going to pay programmers. So, if you look at the whole IT sector, you know, programming is a certain fraction of that. Nowhere near half, much less. And then in programming, most of it's custom software. So development of proprietary software is a small fraction of a small fraction of this whole sector. I'm sure it's a pretty small number of jobs in Australia. So that's the, the fraction that we might conceivably lose if we insist on free software all the time. Meanwhile, there's another sector that develops, the sector of providing support and services, changing and adapting software <coughs> for other people, which we gain. Is the, so which one's bigger? I don't know. But what is clear is that there is no chance of a large decrease. Nothing bad is going to happen on the employment front as a result of this. Now, you're probably not going to have much chance of being employed as a programmer in Australia because Indians will get those jobs. <laughs> Better face the facts. This may be an entirely theoretical question. <laughs> it may be that the only programmers employed in Australia are the ones making changes and adaptations in free software for Australian clients because then they have an advantage because they're nearby. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm not a programmer, so I'm probably going to make a fool of myself. From a more philosophical point of view, I really admire your commitment to freedom and how you've engineered your life to serve that purpose. But if you look at um, the values of programmers, I, I would contend that the supreme value is efficiency more than freedom. And for example, I we could speculate about what the values of any particular programmer might be. They're just make, not all alike. If you're making a program, you make, you're making it so that it works in, in the best way possible. So I remember reading an interview with you, or a speech, where you said, for example, the X community, which is a kind of software, I, I've got no idea what it does, but they're, they're proprietary, but we don't want to fork from them because there's a lot No, of that's not true. You've mis you, you misread it. Really? The X window system is free software. Right. Although, and, and what I said was, you see, they use a different free software license from ours. And their license is very permissive. In fact, we could make a modified version of the X window system and put it under our license, which defends freedom more. But I, my conclusion is, 
it's better if we keep cooperating with them on their terms. Because their software is free software, because it basically is a good project. They're not doing things the way I would have recommended, but they are respecting your freedom. And so, therefore, in that area, when it comes to their software, what I said was, most of all, let's cooperate with them and help them develop it better. But things have changed. Actually, that community has split up. And uh, they actually, the different splits use different licenses. Well, it isn't completely, and I think that part of it may be patented, and in any case, it isn't all implemented. In fact, we've been urging people for years to implement it, and there are obstacles they run into. When you say implement it, you need to do I mean, make a free player so that you can view it. There are free players out there. I've seen them. I looked, at, I looked into this recently, and there are free Flash players that more or less work for displaying things, but they don't work for reading input. So they may work on some sites and not on others. I don't look at these sites myself, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, if, you know, if a free Flash player starts working well enough, then maybe this, this area won't be a problem anymore. I hope so. You want to work on it? <laughs> I can't hear you. What did you say? A Ming, which Ming's, which is what? Uh, it creates flesh um, and SVG output. Um, at the C -based library type stuff. Ah, it's well, I guess when there are good enough flash players, it will be a useful thing. Is it free software? <laughs> <laughs> what? It's been a source for many years. Very, very well, not everything on SourceForge is free software. For one thing, SourceForge is an open source site. They say. So there, there are some licenses that are open source licenses, but not free software licenses. You see, they drew, when they drew up, when the open source people drew up their criteria, they more or less followed the, the lines of free software, but they wrote it differently, so the actual boundaries are different. But the other thing is, SourceForge will let people develop things that are not even open source. However, is it free software? Therefore, I ask you. Okay, so it is free software. Well, that's nice of you. Thank you for contributing. Yeah, I work for the government, and I'm um, curious to know it's a completely Microsoft owned shop, and um, there are strong organizational barriers to introducing free software into the place, not only because of management and the amount that they are in bed with Microsoft, but because of the other developers, their fear of change, and their inability to program within a free software environment. What I'd say is denounce them constantly. <laughs> Well, find another job. <laughs> really, are you a citizen or are you a puppet? When you find some, no, everyone should insist on free software because everyone should insist on defending freedom. But when it comes to a government agency, there's an addition. It has the duty to ensure it has the control of its own computers. You have a right to control your own computers. The government agency has not merely a right, but a duty to control its own computers. It may not let that control fall into the hands of any specific private party, because then it has given up the sovereignty that it must maintain for the sake of the citizens. Using a non-free program in that government agency is giving a private party power it must never have. What's uh, the most free internet in Europe? And it's a sad thing. I told you how many people have started adding non-free bonus programs to GNU slash Linux. In fact, this went so far that until recently I didn't know of any distribution of GNU slash Linux that I could recommend. I had to tell people I didn't know what to say to them. But now there's a, a distribution that is entirely free software. It's called Ututo. And uh, that's what I recommend. You can find a link to it on the GNU site. What's your view about um, PDF 
PDF format is fully documented. Some of the latest features are patented in some countries. But if you don't use those, I don't see any problem with it. Yeah, what do you think of the SEO um, incident? <laughs> well, SEO is a company that's suing IBM and claiming it violated some contract, which I've never seen. And this is relevant because this was involved in IBM's contributions to Linux, the kernel of the GNU slash Linux system. Well, since I don't know what IBM actually did and I've never seen the contract, I don't have an opinion about that, but about the, that, that, those particular accusations. But I will say that this is not a big threat to our community. Software patents and digital restrictions management, the things that can prohibit free software, say that we're not allowed to do the jobs that users want. That's the real threat. I'm pretty happy with what the Brazilian government's doing in this area. It's pushing for free software pretty strongly. It's refusing to allow software idea patents. It's refusing to uh, give digital restrictions management any special legal privilege. So it's maintaining users' control over their own computers. Big organization in a university like Apple or Microsoft are pushing the the university to use uh, specific license to uh, well, add more developers and uh, add more of, the, of their product to the university. Can you comment in particular on uh, the use of free software in uh, universities and public? Uh, schools have a duty to use free software. There are four reasons for this. For four reasons why schools should use free software. One is to save money. It's a terrible waste of money now, if you're in a school that's overflowing with money and has no shortage, maybe that wouldn't be an issue. But every school system I know of is pressed for money. And they shouldn't be spending any on permission to run non-free software. However, you'll, there are some proprietary software developers that will give gratis copies to the schools and to the students. They do this for the same reason that tobacco companies used to give out free samples. <laughs> they want to get the students addicted. They want those kids to grow up to be hooked. And it's interesting. Uh, somebody in, uh, in the Brazilian government said this. And for a while, Microsoft's uh, puppet in Brazil was threatening to sue him until I mailed him a copy of what Gates actually said saying the exact same thing. <laughs> so they, they basically let that fall, drop. Uh, so that's the second reason why schools should do this. Schools should have a duty to society to help direct society onto the path of strength, not weakness, of self-reliance, not permanent dependency. The use of non-free software is permanent dependency. The school should make sure that their students grow up and graduate as users of free software so that society as a whole escapes the painful dependency that gives the developers of non-free software power over society. They should help shift society from the path that leads to constantly increasing dependency onto the path of strength and freedom. That's the Second reason, and you know, the, these companies may offer gratis copies to the schools and to the students, but they won't offer it to everybody after they've graduated. And even these gratis offers may turn out to have a, a, a hook inside them, because you may have, the school may have to pay for the upgrades. So even those gratis offers may be too expensive to accept. However, there's a deeper reason. The third reason to, for schools to insist on free software is for the sake of education. Some students, when they reach 
14 or 15 will want to learn everything about what's going on inside the computer system. If the kid's using a computer, she'll want to learn everything. What is, how does this program work? Well, if the program is proprietary, the teacher will have to respond, sorry, I don't know, you're not allowed to know, nobody in the school is allowed to know, because it's a secret. And education ends there. But if this program is free software, the teacher can say, I only know a little bit, this is what I know, but if you want to learn more, here's the source code for this program so you can learn it. And this is how people become good programmers. The way you learn to write good code is by reading a lot of code and writing a lot of code. Every time you read some code and it's hard to understand, that teaches you something you shouldn't do in your own school.